they, um, oops, sorry, they need to live inside another organism in order to survive. We don't consider them living though, because um, they don't satisfy one of the criteria for life. And that is that they can't reproduce on their own. They need to be inside a host cell in order to reproduce. And therefore that's why we consider them not living. Um, but I think the point that they need to be inside a host cell to reproduce is why we find ourselves in the problem that we have now. Um, and you'll understand more in a minute. Um, so these are just some pictures of viruses. No, I'm not gonna walk through all of that information on here, but I just figured I'd put up some pretty pictures. Um, why is it not letting me advance? Okay, so this is kind of a little brief viral structure. Two, viruses can come in two forms. They can come as naked viruses or enveloped viruses. Um, and the central core of the enveloped virus is the same as the naked virus. Um, so they both have this protein coat and then they have their genetic material in the middle. And that's a naked virus and an envelope virus, which is what SARS-CoV-2 is, has this additional layer and it's actually there to protect it. This additional layer is derived from human cells. It's actually derived from the cell membrane of a human cell. So that outer um, layer on a human cell, the virus kind of hijacks a piece of that and makes it its outer layer. And that's one way the virus can um, hide from our immune response. It essentially, it coats itself with part of the outside of our cells. Um, and then you'll notice that um, this envelope has these blue circles. And I'm sure you've seen pictures of coronavirus on the news. And I, I'm pretty sure that you've heard of the term spike protein. Um, and so this um, blue circle on the outer shell of this envelope virus, it would represent the spike protein. Um, and so basically the outer shell is derived from the host cell membrane. And then what the virus does is it puts its own little proteins on that outer shell as well. Um, and that's an envelope virus. And then this is um, a very dense slide. And the point of me showing you this slide is only to show you this right here is the family of coronaviruses. Okay, and coronaviruses, they're considered RNA viruses because their genome is composed of RNA. And, you know, you can ignore all this. I think the point I wanna make is that it is one small family of a larger family of RNA viruses. Um, there's a separate family tree for DNA viruses. So there's also viruses that have G DNA genomes. Um, and so from a, complexity point of view um, with respect to the number of types of viruses out there, this group of coronaviruses is a very, very small group. But as we're seeing, they can evolve very rapidly um, into many different variants that can cause problems. And so can all of these other viruses. We're just dealing right now with coronavirus. So let me talk to you about their life cycle. Okay, so I mentioned to you before that the only way a virus can reproduce is it when it is inside a host cell. So how does it get in there? What does it do? How does it reproduce? That's kind of what I'm at showing you here. So the way it gets in is it attaches to a host cell. Okay, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, so I'm kind of skipping ahead and I'll review this in a minute as well. The virus, those spike proteins of the virus are looking for a specific protein that exists on certain host cells in the human called ACE2. And if, if the virus spike protein finds ACE2 on the host cell, then they'll link together and the virus will get into the host cell, okay? You can imagine the viral spike protein is like a key and the ACE2 receptor is like a lock. And so the virus will stick its key into the ACE2 receptor and then get into the host cell. So that's the process of attachment and penetration. Once it's inside that host cell, the virus basically tells that host cell, okay, I don't care what you're doing, stop what you're doing. 
your job is now only to make more copies of me. And so it basically, it hijacks the host cell. It takes it over and makes the host cell make lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of the virus. And that's the biosynthesis and assembly stage. So it just basically says, stop what you're doing, make lots of me. You are now a virus producing factory. And then the last step is called release. And that's when the host cell um, releases the new um, newly formed viruses into the human body and they will then go on and infect more host cells. Okay, so when you're infected with any virus, not even just SARS-CoV-2, any virus, this is kind of the general process that occurs, okay? Um, this is just kind of, kind of honing in a little bit more on the entry part, that attachment part. So again, I mentioned SARS-CoV-2 has a spike protein. That spike protein is gonna bind to the ACE2 receptor and once they interact, then the virus can kind of slowly push in, and you see there's lots of interactions here, push in, and then it gets into the host cell, and that's when it tells the host cell, you know, stop what you're doing. And then this is a picture here of how the virus exits and ends up with that envelope, that outer layer of the virus. So this is a virus that's just about to leave the cell, it's going to migrate towards the cell membrane. This is the host cell membrane. It's going to push against that cell membrane, eventually leading to this kind of bulge here. And then the virus will pop out, taking part of the host cell membrane with it. And then it'll stick its spike proteins in there. Okay, and this is actually, this figure here is actually not um, SARS. This is, this is um, the flu virus. How, so the flu virus also exits a host cell the, the same way. And this is um, two electron micrographs of two different viruses leaving a host cell by this process I just described, it's called budding. So this is um, a picture of a host cell here and you can see these um, buds coming off of the host cell and, and these buds contain flu virus. And then this one here is HIV. So you can see this larger piece that I'm kind of outlining that is um, the host cell and then um, all of these little buds here are HIV kind of budding out and you can see this is the mature HIV. Okay, so, so the phenomena that corona or the process that coronavirus uses to leave host cells is, is um, a pretty well-established process that other viruses use as well. Okay, so there's a lot of information on this slide. I'm gonna make it simple, especially because I said some of the stuff already. So um, SARS-CoV-2, it belongs to the coronavirus family, which is on that first slide. I showed you where that was. I boxed it off in red. Um, it's more specifically a beta coronavirus. There's alpha coronaviruses. Those usually cause the common cold. And then there's beta coronavirus, which is um, the organisms that cause sars COVID-19, MERS, so they're all beta coronaviruses. And um, what you may or may not find surprising is that um, coronaviruses are wild viruses. They actually circulate in more, most commonly bats. And they have done um, genetic sequencing of different um, viruses from bats and found Corona, SARS-CoV-2 sequences in bats that are 40 to, DNA from bats from 40 to 70 years old, um, years ago, sorry. Um, and so I'm just highlighting that, I know that there's a big debate right now about whether or not um, SARS-CoV-2 came from the lab in Wuhan or whether it is a naturally circulating coronavirus. And I, I don't have any insight at all about which one of those two scenarios are true. Um, I would not be surprised if it was a wild circulating coronavirus. I suspect that we will really never know the answer to that question. Where did SARS-CoV-2 come from? And the reason why I suspect this is because we still do not know where the, or the anthrax came from um, 20 years ago after the 9-11 um, tragedy. I'm not sure if you remember the anthrax going in the mail. Our, the scientific community doesn't know where it comes from. There is a hypothesis that it came from a lab 
um, down at CDC. And I, I distinctly remember, this is when I first started teaching, getting a letter in the mail, and I actually saved it, um, from the FBI, you know, outlining that they were investigating every single member of the Amer American Society for Microbiology because they believed that one of us um, may have been involved in spreading the anthrax because they had tracked it down at that time to one of the labs at CDC. But as I said, they still don't know where that's from. So I'm not confident that we are going to really know where SARS-CoV-2 came from. Um, in any case, I already told you SARS-CoV-2, um, the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor. Um, and that receptor, it's not present on all human cells. And that's, that's very common. Um, it, it appears on respiratory cells. Um, it appears on kidney cells, liver cells, cells of your digestive tract, and cells in your heart, okay? Um, ACE2, for those of you who want to go a little deeper, it stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, you know, that's just a minor detail. Um, but its function is responsible for blood pressure, wound healing, and inflammation. Um, and so it has an actual role in the human body other than being the, the lock for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and if you think about this from an evolutionary perspective, what viruses do is they kind of hijack a protein on our cells um, as, it's, as their lock. Um, but in reality, that protein has a real function in us. So this is common as well. Um, when SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor, it gets into the host cell, and I already showed you how, but it also blocks the activity of ACE2. And that's one of the features that leads to some of the more se severe symptoms um, that one would experience if they get um, severely ill from SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, increased inflammation, and that's going to lead to organ and tissue damage. Um, and so even the part of entry of the virus into a host cell um, can exacerbate the process of getting ill. Um, so after SARS-CoV-2 infects the lungs, if you're to become symptomatic, that's when you're going to start to get symptoms. Um, it's spread through, I think we, we've heard this already on news or wherever, through aerosolized droplets, um, when people speak, when they cough, when they sneeze. Um, the symptoms typically associated with normal, I say normal, the Wuhan, the alpha variant of SARS-CoV-2 can range from asymptomatic to fever, cough, loss of taste and smell, congestion, to even more severe um, problems, including trouble breathing, pneumonia, and then unfortunately mortality. So um, there's a big question about um, how would one know if they're going to be asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic, or have full-blown severe SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Um, and part of that is defined by whether or not an individual has predisposing factors. But part of it also um, is kind of a little bit of a black box in respiratory, um, pathogenic respiratory diseases. So for example, um, Tony had mentioned my, I, I work in tuberculosis and um, individuals who breathe in the organism that have, that um, causes tuberculosis, some of them are going to come down with active tuberculosis. Some of those individuals will clear the bacteria, they will have no infection, and some will go into latent disease. And we understand some of the details of how those three scenarios occur, but um, a lot of it has to do with the amount of bacteria the individual breathes in, how quickly the human immune response can respond. Um, so it's, it's, and everybody's different. So there's a lot of factors that dictate whether or not someone's going to be symptomatic or asymptomatic or severely symptomatic. Um, so I, 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 any, any scientist who tells you, okay, yes, this is how it's definitely going to end up for you. Um, they can't really say that because there's too many unknowns 
because we're, our immune responses are all different um, and we all respond in different ways. And huh, here we are. Um, so the, the scary thing about COVID-19 is that, um, and a lot of other viruses do this, but COVID seems to be pretty good at doing this, um, is that it does interfere with the human immune response. So if you contract COVID-19 and the virus is really able to take a stronghold, it will impair your immune response. And we're still learning about all of this. Um, so I can't tell you a lot of details um, because we're still learning. Um, I already mentioned there's a link between predisposing factors and severe disease, um, including age, whether or not you have diabetes, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. So um, that, that has been known for, for more than a year. Um, <coughs> individuals who succumb to COVID-19 primarily do so through, excuse me, I gotta get a drink of water. I gotta tickle my throat. <coughs> um, primarily due to acute respiratory disease syndrome or ARDS and something called a cytokine, cytokine storm which is um, cytokines are molecules produced by the human immune response that um, they really regulate how the immune response um, responds to infections. But if you have too many cytokines, it's actually not a good thing. So um, SARS-CoV-2 kind of turns up the level of cytokines that are um, produced leading to what we call a cytokine storm. Um, and this is really interesting. So this is a paper that I, um, I read in, in early January and I put it back here because um, this was talking about natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2 in individuals who um, were infected with SARS-CoV-2, not vaccinated individuals. And I, I think that it's interesting that the article um, is saying that immunity from natural infection may last up to eight months um, because now we're learning um, that immunity to the vaccine um, may be only up to eight months, right? So I, I see a correlation, um, but I caution again, even though I see a correlation between what I just said and the paper I just quoted, I think I need to see more data on vaccination immunity due to vaccination before I can say definitively, there is a direct link between these two phenomena. Um, it looks like it's heading in that direction though. Okay, so here's the big question, evolution of the virus. And this is, this is something that really, um, I think people, I'm gonna generalize, people generally don't understand and why masking is so important and why getting vaccinated is so important. Um, and that is because if you are not immune to SARS-CoV-2 um, and you do not wear a mask to protect yourself, you are basically um, allowing the virus or providing the virus the option to infect you, whether or not you're symptomatic or not doesn't matter, right? You're an entry place for the virus. And when the virus is in you, it can mutate. And it may, not may or may not impact you when it mutates, but it can mutate. Any person it infects, it can mutate in that person to create, uh, I don't remember what we're on, we, we lambda mu variant, you know? So, you know, and it, no, one, no one knows when and where that's gonna happen, but any susceptible individual is providing the opportunity for that to occur. And, and that's because, remember, I said at the beginning of this talk, it's a virus. Its only job is to survive and reproduce. And it wants to get better at that, right? It's, it's simple, it's, it's from my perspective as, as a microbiologist, this is so elegant. It just wants to get better at surviving and reproducing and it will do whatever it can to do that. Um, and so just to highlight my point and to give my, my voice a little bit of a break, this is a two minute video. Um, HHMI is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute. They provide wonderful educational materials um, for anybody. It's a free site you can go on to. Um, I use this a lot, HHMI in my classroom. Um, 
to highlight, you know, whatever I'm talking about in class. Um, it takes a minute for it to get to the website, but the video is two minutes long. And it has some relaxing music. So here's here's SARS-CoV-2 evolution. The SARS. I think there's. A, we're not seeing the video. Oh really? Is that because it's a, it opened up in a browser on your and you have to share yeah. the browser? Yeah. I've never had that happen before. Oh, that would make me really sad. I have another video too. Okay, I'm gonna stop share and try again. Okay. Um, let's see. Optimize for video clip. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, let's see. You may be sharing only that. Yeah, I think, thank you, Walt. I think, can you see it now? Yes. Yes, okay, so let's try. Single strand of RNA with genes that encode fewer than 30 proteins. The SARS-CoV-2 genome is a single strand of RNA with genes that encode fewer than 30 proteins. This is less than 0.1% of the proteins encoded by the human genome. The virus's genome is made of about 30,000 building blocks called nucleotides, which are represented by the letters A, U, C, and G. The unique sequence of nucleotides in a genome determines the proteins it encodes. When the virus infects a cell, its genome is replicated or copied. First, the virus makes strands of complementary RNA called template RNAs. The template RNAs are used to produce copies that match the original virus's genome. This genome replication process is prone to errors. These errors are called mutations. Mutations can occur at random anywhere in the genome. For example, in this mutation, a U was substituted with an A. A nucleotide can be substituted with a different nucleotide, added in the wrong place, or left out. When the mutated virus infects another cell, all the new viruses replicated from it will have the same mutation, plus any new mutations that occur. Depending on the locations and types of mutations, they may or may not affect a virus's ability to spread in a population. Viruses with mutations that help the virus replicate or infect cells have a selective advantage. These viruses usually become more common in a population over time. Viruses with mutations that make them less effective at replication or infection have a selective disadvantage. These viruses usually become less common in a population over time. Mutations that have no effect on the virus are called neutral mutations. Viruses with neutral mutations replicate just as well as viruses without these mutations. Tracking mutations and viruses can help determine where an outbreak started and how it spread. Understanding how virus populations change over time can also help scientists develop treatments and vaccines. So now I think I have to reshare to get back to my PowerPoint. No. Yes, that's where I want to go. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So, um, so that was the video on evolution. Um, I will point out that uh, the virus uh, SARS, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. SARS-CoV, evolution of SARS-CoV-2 um, is, is not a phenomenon that's unique to SARS-CoV-2. All viruses evolve. Um, the reason why we are, or not required, but we should get a flu shot every year is because the flu virus evolves and um, it evolves actually more rapidly than SARS-CoV-2. 
which is why we need to get vaccinated um, annually with a new vaccine. Um, and so I guess the big takeaway from this is that SARS-CoV-2 can't evolve, it can't change. You won't have any more variants um, if there are no individuals around that can carry infection. And so that's, that's the biggest concern right now is we need to make sure we're decreasing the spread of the virus to make sure that there are less variants, less opportunities for variants to occur. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about how um, the United States has kind of decided to char characterize variants because you may have heard some of this terminology um, recently. So the US or the CDC has come up with three levels of concern. Okay, so a variant of interest is a variant of SARS-CoV-2 that has evolved, it has mutations in it um, that somehow impact receptor binding. So the interaction between the spike protein and ACE2 um, may have a small impact on treatment and our vaccine success um, and may increase disease transmission or severity, but not to the level as a variant of concern. So a variant of concern and all of the ones that we're seeing right now have been labeled variants of concern, VOCs. Um, but there is an absolute confirmed increase in disease transmission and or severity. So we're certainly seeing that with Delta. And what we don't want to happen is for Delta to turn into a VOHC, um, which means that treatment and prevention methods have significantly reduced effectiveness. Um, and so right now we're on the cusp of, of this maybe happening, um, but we're not there yet. So hopefully we'll, will prevent Delta from evolving further so that we end up in this last category. And so here's some more details for you. So um, the Wuhan variant was the parent, right? And then all of the, from Wuhan, mutations started occurring in different individuals and we ended up with these um, different variants. And if you recall from that video, it did indicate that there are some mutations where you're not gonna see any change in transmissibility. So I highlight that because the variants that we've identified are ones that there's an increase in transmission, but they're certainly not gonna be the only variants. They're just the ones that we're concerned about because of the increase. So alpha variant, that was the UK, we used to call it the UK variant. Um, that had a 50% increase in transmissibility, meaning 50%, it, it was easier to, 50% easier to spread it from individual to individual um, with minimal impact on immunity from vaccination. And that's because alpha, um, the mutations in alpha were um, not represented by the, the components in um, the vaccine. Beta was the South Africa strain or variant. Um, again, 50% increase. There was a little bit of a reduced impact from vaccination. Gamma was the one that originated in Brazil. Um, they, they're, not enough has been studied on it, um, but they do know that there was a reduced impact and here's the Delta variant. Um, and it's currently responsible for 93% of the infections in the United States. Um, we're still researching it. This is for me, 10 to 60% more transmissible than alpha. That's a big range, um, but that's where we're at at this present moment. We haven't narrowed it down. It is, I, I think it's leaning, from what I'm reading, the literature is leaning to 40 to 50% more transmissible than alpha. But here's, a, here's an area where I can say, we don't have a definitive answer yet. And, and so sometimes they report, I heard on the news, um, Delta is just as transmissible as chicken pox. I don't know if we can say that yet. We don't have enough data. We do know it is more transmissible, but, but I don't think we can make comparisons yet. Um, the, it definitely has a reduced impact with respect to vaccination. Um, so from what I'm reading right now, um, the efficacy 
for the mRNA vaccine, so that's Pfizer and um, Moderna, is down to 88%. Um, and then the adenovirus, so the Johnson Johnson vaccine, there's conflicting data. Um, but again, you know, the, there's limited studies because the Delta variant is relatively new. So these numbers I'm giving you can change. Um, and so if you are interested in learning a little bit more and tracking this further, there are some links I have at the bottom of this slide. So I'm hoping, Tony, maybe you could make this PowerPoint available somehow as well so people can click on the links um, if they wanted to learn more. I'll, I'll do that, yes. Um, yeah. Um, and I did that purposely because I figured people might want to keep continuing to track some of this stuff. So these, these websites from the CDC are updated, um, I believe, daily. So, um, you know, you could go there and, and, and this information is from those websites. Okay, so a few weeks ago, um, CDC walked back on part of their recommendation with respect to masking. And they said that um, they want vaccinated individuals to begin to wear masks again if they reside in areas um, where transmissibility um, is either at a high level or substantial level. And when they first did, well, let me back up and tell you as a scientist and members of my professional community, we were all very frustrated with CDC when they got rid of the mask mandate um, because the science did not support that. Um, however, they did and um, now it's back. And the reason why it's back is because of, of um, a phenomenon that happened in Barnstable, Massachusetts, which is in Cape Cod. Um, and I, I remember hearing they had walked back on the mass mandate and they had this data and they had this meeting. And I'm always like, well, I wanna see the data, show me the data. And the paper didn't come out um, for a few more weeks later. So this is the publication here. If you wanna actually read the paper that describes um, the scenario and why CDC walked back on their masking by vaccinated individuals. This is the link to that paper. It's in a journal called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report or MMWR. Um, it's a weekly report. Um, I actually have been using MMWR in my classes as an assignment for years and years and years. I, I'm very familiar with this journal. Um, so I, 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 it's very reputable. Um, and so I, what happened in this particular scenario was that there were in July 469 cases of COVID-19 that resulted from several outdoor events in Barnstable. Um, and 74% of those cases, positive cases were in fully vaccinated individuals. That is really alarming. 79% um, of those individuals had symptomatic in infections, but they were mild because they're vaccinated, right? And so just to take a step back, one of the main, um, at least for the medical community especially, um, things about the vaccine that make them important is that they're preventing severe disease and hospitalization, right? So um, this is disturbing that 79% of individuals um, had, or 74% of individuals were vaccinated and were positive. Um, and it's, it, it's mild infection, which is great. Um, except for four of those individuals actually ended up in the hospital, but there was no mortality resulting from this, ask, this outbreak. But what's most concerning is that the amount of virus in the vaccinated symptomatic people was the same as the amount of virus in individuals who were unvaccinated and COVID-19 positive. And, and that is where we're concerned because viral load means how much virus is in a person. And if there's a lot of virus in a person, then the virus can evolve. The more virus there, the more evolution can occur. Um, and so we, that is not a good scenario. It can lead to a rise in um, variants, especially because 90% of the individuals um, were infected with Delta. 
And so if Delta gets more mutations and becomes more transmissible, that's a problem. So this scenario here and the data resulting from that is why CDC now recommends that fully vaccinated individuals wear masks indoors. Even if you get sick with mild symptoms, because the virus is in you, it can evolve and create another variant that may or may not be um, more resistant to the vaccines, okay? Um, and so that's, that's, that's the scenario with, with um, the CDC walking back on masking. So let's talk a little bit more about masking. This picture here on the left um, is a picture I use, I've been using for years in my classes to demonstrate why covering one's mouth is important um, to prevent this kind of explosion of aerosols um, that can carry um, infectious agents, any infectious agent. Um, and then this is from a recent paper um, where they're showing you know, an individual sneezing, coughing, and exhaling, um, and how far the respiratory aerosols can travel. Now, in, in science, we do not use um, the English form of measurement. We use metric or the American. So um, that's why these numbers here, these are in meters. So I kind of did a rough line at where six feet is so that you could see that that six feet um, isn't an arbitrary number. It is a number that's derived from studies like this that demonstrate how far respiratory aerosols can travel in the air. Um, so it's, it's, it is a data-based number. Um, and I did not, oh no, the citation, no, I, I have the citation for this paper um, if, uh, if anybody's interested for that. But I wanted to show you this video here. So I'm gonna have to do the stop share again and um, pull up this video. So hold on a second, let me stop share and then reshare. Uh, share screen. And now I, oh wait, I have to go into the video first, sorry. Um, <laughs> let's see. Okay, so now I'm in the video. Technology, you gotta love it, right? All right, here we go. Okay, so this is before I before I um, put this video on. Let me set up set the stage. So this is a paper that recently came out. Remember, I said at the beginning of this talk that we never, as a scientific community, never asked some of the questions we're asking right now about masking and you know, does it protect just me? Does it protect you? All of that stuff. We never asked those questions. I, when I was in graduate school and, and now when I do some research with, with um, um, pathogenic or disease causing TB, when I go into a biosafety level three lab, I put a mask on. I put a mask on because I don't wanna get TB. I, I never thought over the years working in labs, I'm gonna put in a mask on in the biosafety level three lab in order to protect my lab mates from me, right? That's not a thing. I always thought I put a mask on to protect me. Um, and so SARS-CoV-2 is certainly having us think about things in a, in a way we never did before. So anyway, this is a recent paper that talked about how far um, do respiratory aerosols spread um, when you talk? And if you have a mask on, how far do they spread? And they used laser light scattering um, in order to visual have you have us when we view this vis video visualize the air droplets and how far they go. So this is um, an individual who does not have a mask on um, who is going to be repeating the phrase "stay healthy," and you're going to see the respiratory aerosols um, as flashes of light, where the light is brighter for the aerosols that are. Um, that are um, larger versus the smaller aerosols. And then the video continues with someone who wears the mask to see the difference. So here's the video. Now I'm recording. Stay healthy. Great. Stay 
healthy. Great, less loud. Stay healthy. Are you recording? Yeah. Stay healthy. Louder. Stay healthy. Louder. Stay healthy. Nothing. Okay, and this is this is a paper from April 15th in the New England Journal of Medicine. So you can clearly see from that video that wearing the mask actually does prevent respiratory aerosols from um, leaving your mouth when you are speaking. Um, and, and that will then um, decrease the amount of virus that's present and um, if, somebody else is also wearing a mask, the chances of breathing in aerosols with a variant um, is much lower. Um, and so this is, these are two other studies that, um, and this one came out recently um, on masking and how masking has been effective in preventing the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention really quick the difference between um, Delta and all these other is that Delta has five mutations in the spike protein that are concerning. Um, you can imagine the spike protein, remember, is the lock and the ACE2 receptor is the key. And um, you can imagine that in Delta, other way around, Delta, the spike is the key, ACE2 is the lock. You can imagine in Delta that now, the spike protein has a magnet on it. And so now it's more attracted to the ACE2 receptor and it binds and sticks there more tightly. So the reason why Delta is more concerning is because the interaction between the spike and ACE2 is stronger and because the spike protein is much more attracted and can track down ACE2 much better than the previous variants. Okay, there are three vaccines that are currently available. I'm sure everybody knows this, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. Um, there is, I participated in this study. This is a paper that came out um, in May on the side effects associated with the Pfizer-BioNTech. Um, they're still tracking data on side effects. It's going to continue until um, the... EUA, the emergency use, use, author, ugh, use authorizations change to full authorization um, for each of the different vaccinations in this country. And so I just wanted to share this data. Um, there's probably more recent data, but the point is that the, most of the side effects from the vaccine are mild side effects. Um, the vaccine ingredients, they either have the generally vaccines, this is general vaccine ingredients, sorry, have genetic material. Um, they have things that keep the pH at the same level as the human body. Um, they have some detergent in them to prevent the um, vaccine material from sticking to the tubes and the syringes they're in, and some sort of stabilizer to protect the vaccine from freezing and thawing. Um, these are some of the ingredients in the vaccines that are associated with some of the severe reactions that you may have heard about in the news. Um, the mRNA vaccine, so the Moderna and the Pfizer have something called PEG or polyethylene glycol in them. Um, that's not an uncommon component of vaccines. It is found in other vaccines. Um, and so it's part of the mRNA vaccine. And then the adenovirus vaccine, so the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, has another common vaccine component called polysorbate 80, and that's one of the surfacants. But those are the two molecules that seem to be causing some of the more adverse side effects um, in some individuals. And so this, this slide here um, is to kind of demonstrate that the severe side effects associated with vaccination, um, which for the mRNA vaccine, so the Pfizer, Bi BioNTech, and Moderna, um, those of severe side effects are um, typically anaphylaxis, 
which is um, a severe allergic reaction. Um, and there has not been, and it's been um, reported 2.5 to 11 cases of severe anaphylaxis per million doses of the vaccine. And there's been no risk of mortality. Whereas Johnson & Johnson, um, that one, they have a um, 0. 0.00002 um, cases of a severe clotting disorder per million doses. Um, and there has been um, three deaths recorded thus far that are directly linked to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, but please know that they have already, ad they've administered 8 million Johnson & Johnson vaccines <coughs> and the mortality, um, there's been three deaths. And the mortality rate from COVID-19 is much higher. So, you know, I know uh, many individuals are very concerned about the vaccination, but mortality from COVID is much higher than the risk of mortality from the vaccines. It's still not an easy choice to make, but um, if you're just looking at numbers and not putting in the people in the story, um, the math suggests that vaccination is safer than getting COVID-19. And so this is kind of a little um, cartoon on vaccination. And, and it's true, you know, there, the vaccines have prevented some pretty severe diseases. Um, and so it is important that, um, you know, serious conversations happen with your physicians and medical professionals about getting the vaccine. Okay, so what kind of resources do I use when I want to, um, to learn more? Um, so if you're really into the science and you want to be as up-to-date as possible and um, knowing that science is not written in a language that's accessible to everybody. Um, so the papers I read, it took me a very long time to understand all the language in those papers, um, but they're freely available for anybody to look at. And the best place I would recommend is the American Society for Microbiology COVID-19 Research Re Re Registry. That website has, um, it always has kind of an introduction to what's the newest things that were found within the week. And I, I, I believe that it's written in, a, in very user-friendly language. Um, and then it has links to the actual scientific publications and it has, them categorized by immunology, um, virology, you know, and so on and so forth. So you can kind of go into those links and find the actual papers. Um, you can go to Pfizer's website. You can go to Moderna's website. You can go to Johnson and Johnson's website. You can go to the CDC. Um, CDC also has a website for vaccine hesitant individuals to learn more. Johns Hopkins is an amazing resource. Um, the other resource I was going to mention to you, um, again, I have to, let me see if I still have it up, Dalio, 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 uh, Dalio Center, I guess, um, is the Dalio Center, which is um, out of New York Presbyterian Hospital. And I'm just going to show you that I didn't put this in the presentation, but they have a, a vaccine information education center as well. Um, and it, the resources here are wonderful and they are very user-friendly to watch and read. So um, if, if you want to learn more, these are the places I would suggest you go to. Um, we all love news media, but sometimes I think scientists are really bad at communicating to the general public about what we know and what we understand. And then that gets filtered through the news media. And sometimes, unfortunately, some of the information is, is interpreted not the way it was intended. So I always recommend using those websites and not just any kind of resource because you'll get the really unfiltered information. And I just chattered for quite some time and I'm, I'm honored that you're all here <laughs> and I would welcome any questions that you have.
Yeah, well, well th thank you very much, Marcy. And I, and I apologize for starting the recording a little late. So we missed that great intro that you provided. And, and maybe just for the record and for folks that are going to see the video afterwards, I'll, I'll provide the brief uh, <laughs> uh, resume on you. So you're, you're trained in infectious disease, focusing on re respiratory path pathogens. Uh, and you are the, the biology chair at Department of Biology Chair at Pace University in New York City, um, as well as the Pleasantville campus. Your research is focused on how the causative agent of tuberculosis responds to molecules produced by the human immune response. Uh, Dr. Kelly teaches general biology one to STEM, pre-med and health science majors, and also teaches general microbiology to biology, pre-med and health sciences majors, and advanced microbiology to biology and pre-med majors. Um, Dr. Kelly is on the university's, the Pace University COVID-19 task force, to make and implement the decisions that have protected the Pace University community from the pandemic. So I wanna make sure that that was okay. out there in the recording so folks uh, know. And she is a resident of Lewisboro and um, has uh, one child going to college and another one who's yep. a sophomore in high school. Yep, uh, Okay. 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 Um, so I think at this point we will entertain questions. So if anyone, um, please raise your hand if you wanna ask a question. And George Eggleston, whoops, I'm sorry, George, can you, um, yeah, raise your hand, yeah. Sorry about that, George, I'll, I'll get you next. I accidentally put your hand down, but let me, let me see. Actually, George, can you, Wait. well, all right, let, let's try that again. Um, no, he's unmuting, he's. Oh, he is, yeah. okay. Hi, George. Hello, doctor, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I wrote this down. So here's the question. Yes. What if once you're infected, mm -hmm. what are the mechanics that a vaccine employs to block the virus? So if you're, are you asking um, if you're infected and like while you're ill, you are requesting a vaccine no, or no. down the road? I'm already vaccinated. Okay. And now I'm out in a large group. Uh -huh. and I become infected. Mm -hmm. What is it the vaccine is actually doing or performing to mitigate the impact of that infection? Yeah, so that's a loaded question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, in a perfect scenario, we get vaccinated, we don't get sick, right? That's, that's the end goal, because the idea of vaccination is to mimic the natural infection so that your immune response learns about it um, and then responds and remembers how to respond, right? And, and so that's what's supposed to happen. What we're finding now is that um, as time is going on, those of us who have been vaccinated, our immune response is starting to forget and we need to have it re member a little better. So that's why we're having conversations about booster shots. Um, in addition, parallel to that, so it's kind of like a balance. Um, these new variants are, are popping up. And the way that the vaccines that we have right now are working is that they contain a little bit of information about the spike protein. So that our immune response says, oh, look, that part of the spike protein, that that's not supposed to be here and I'm gonna attack it, I'm gonna remember it, right? Well, if the spike protein in the, the virus changes, so much so that the piece that was in the vaccine doesn't match anymore, that's also a problem. So we've got two things going on right now. We've got what, what's called waning immunity, where those of us who are vaccinated are starting to forget, our immune responses are starting to forget um, how to respond. And we've also got the variants happening and the spike protein changing. So um, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, if, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. just to focus a little more specifically on sure. when, when, the, when, when, you, when you become infected, mm -hmm. okay, and the vaccine, I'll just generalize, the vaccine then has done something uh, to help our um, cells recognize the vaccine and fight it more effectively. Mm -hmm. So 
is the vaccine itself injecting some type of chemicals to enhance our immunity or is it how is it enhancing our own immunity or is it bouncing a ball off a wall because it can't get through okay so <laughs> so in any vaccine so this is not just covid right so vaccines in general um they inject you with a molecule in this case it's spike but it could be any any part of a an organism um and when they inject you with that molecule, your immune response immediately says, this is not self, this is not part of me. And so your immune response comes in, attacks it, gets rid of it. So I think that's what you're getting at, gets rid of it and then remembers how to get rid of it, right? So the immune response really, it's, it's I could go on and on about the immune response. It is so amazing and complicated. And anybody who's ever taken immunology it's insane, but wonderful and amazing. The immune response, um, the basic premise is it learns when you're in your mother's womb and when you're young, what do self cells and things look like? And once it determines what self looks like, anything else that gets in your body that's not self, it attacks and gets rid of, even a vaccine. So when you're injected with the mRNA or the um, adenovirus, the immune response recognizes that as non-self, it gets rid of it and then remembers how it got rid of it so that if it sees it again, it'll, it'll get rid of it again. And it, so, if it's, oh, sorry, yes. No, sorry, no, so I'll, I'll, I'll get off of this, but I just wanted okay. to ask one more thing because sure. I, I still don't, I understand everything you've just said. Okay. Um, uh, but when you described how the virus attaches itself to our host cell, mm -hmm. I'll use that word. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, our host cell is readily taking this in because it's being tricked because it's, it's an RNA like itself. So it recognizes some piece of that virus as being okay. I mean, that's just my generalization. So when our natural immune response, which should immediately react to that, and fight it, we need a vaccine to make that happen effectively. You see what I mean? On one hand, you can get infected immediately or whatever time frame is because your immune response is in dealing with it. And I'm talking about a healthy individual. The vaccine comes along and, and somehow helps our immune system to fight it effectively. Otherwise you wouldn't have an 83% effectiveness. And that's kind of that word that I'm, I'm searching for, definition. It's effective at doing what in my body? The vaccine, you yeah. mean? Yes. So the, I, I, I'm not, I feel like I'm missing part of what you're asking me. That's all right. So I'm gonna try. That's all right. <laughs> I, <laughs> but I, these are the things I'm, I'm gleaning from what you're asking me that I think is important to understand. And maybe, maybe I'm like totally not getting it, but um, you get, when you get that vaccine, none of the material from that vaccine remains in you, right? So, so it's there, your immune response says, it's not supposed to be there. I wanna get rid of it. I, and your immune response gets rid of it and then you get infected with the virus and your immune response recognizes the spike protein on the virus because it remembers what the spike protein looked like when it was exposed to the vaccine. And then what it essentially does is it kind of coats that spike protein. So if my, my um, left hand, I'm like right, left, my left hand is um, let's say the spike protein. And this is, my immune response. What my immune response will do if you're vaccinated is it'll remember spike protein bad and I want to get rid of it. I'm going to coat it with um, antibodies, which I'm, I'm assuming everybody's heard that term from the news as well. And if I coat it with antibodies, then the site that it uses to bind to the host cell can't bind to the host cell. And so when you're vaccinated, what your immune response remembers is how to make those antibodies to coat it. Among other things, 
but yeah. antibodies is, is kind of the terminology I think everybody's learning. Um, and so then, it's an early warning system that has correct. already educated yes. My, yes. My, my cells to mm -hmm. recognize the yes. danger. Yes. Otherwise, without the vaccine, it doesn't immediately recognize that danger. Yes. And the virus can attach itself readily, I'll just yes. say. Yes, that's exactly it. And once it attaches, it's too late. Correct. The vaccine can't help that situation. Correct. Okay. All right. I got it. I, Thank you. I feel successful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George. All right. So we'll go on to Barbara Mangione next. How's that, Tony? Good. You're good. Okay. Hi, Marcy. Thanks for hey, doing Barbara. this. Hey, <laughs> Barbara. Um, I have a question. Um, and as you know, I've spoken to you before. You know, we have had the unfortunate experience of losing eight people in, in a year, you know, five relatives and three friends. And I'd have to say in the majority of the cases, uh, the progression of the illness seemed to follow the typical tra trajectory that you're speaking about where, first of all, most of them were elderly, most of them were in need nursing homes or assisted care. Uh, they weren't, you know, they weren't very healthy to begin with. So, you know, they, they got the virus and had a pretty rapid, you know, decline before they passed away. Uh, three months ago, we lost um, another relative who was more, who was younger. He was only about, I would say, I think he's 54. And he, the way it presented with him was, I think one, I think his family got it. I think one of his children got it and it spread among, you know, the immediate family. He got it and he seemed to be doing well, except eventually, all of a sudden, for lack of a better word, he crashed. It, so does something different happen in those circumstances where, where the patient seems to be having just a relatively mild to moderate case of, you know, of coronavirus with, with symptoms that are, you know, that you see in the mild cases, and then all of a sudden it explodes? Yeah, you know, so that's one of the things, if, if anybody says to you, this is absolutely what happened, um, I, I would be weary. I, mm -hmm. I can tell you, what I, I could have happened. Um, it could have been that as the illness progressed, mm -hmm. a mutation occurred that strengthened the virus, okay. right? That could have happened. It could have happened that, remember I told you the virus um, has one of the unique things about it is that it, it does a pretty nifty job of interfering with the human immune response. Right. Perhaps for whatever reason, there was a threshold of viral numbers in um, that individual that, that reached some level that then impacted his immune response um, negatively. And then the disease became more <laughs> severe. But I, I don't think anybody can really give you a clear this is absolutely what happened type right, right, answer. Right. Yeah. Cause it, it, it was, it was quite sudden. He was doing well. He was at home. He got very sick. He was, he was in the ICU and he passed away 36 hours later. So, but anyway, okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for doing this. Thank you. Hold on a second, I was muted. I'm, I'm just gonna jump to a question that came up on chat. Where do we find science info about natural immunity? we are into a second year of the pandemic. Yeah, you know, that's so, that's so interesting because, um, you know, are we gonna hit a point eventually where we do have some underlying natural immunity? Because like right now I'm fully vaccinated but I could also be asymptomatically infected. So at what point do we reach natural immunity such that you know, COVID will be kind of this underlying, it's never going to go away. I don't imagine it's going to go away, but you know, when, when will it become more like an annoying cold type thing um, where you can learn more about, more about that? Definitely the um, ASM research registry. Um, but again, if you're diving into the papers there, um, you know, they're, they're heavy on the science. Um, Uh, I'm trying to think of like educational materials. Um, if you just like Howard Hughes Medical Institute is a good place to look up. If you like did a, a search with um, on natural immunity to COVID-19 at Howard Hughes, um, 
there's a database that we use called PubMed. Um, if you typed in PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, um, then you're gonna end up at their database and you can type in natural immunity to COVID-19 and see what you can find there. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking off the top of my head on things that would be more user-friendly. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna jump to Paul. Um... Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Kelly, this was great. I, it's along the lines of that last question of from a policy public health perspective, what's our end goal? I joined a little late and I, I think at one point you were mentioning the variants and, and stopping transmission, which seems like a high order task. <laughs> yeah. um, and you, when you presented the Barnstable, the Cape Cod data, to me, that's actually really positive. No, no deaths, very few hospitalizations. I think those are where, where we'll see the most success. How, how do we define that? Because we see too in Lewisboro, we see cases going up and people getting stressed out. If we continue vaccinating, we're, we're reducing those risks. Those cases hopefully will become less important, right? Less severe and so on. Right. I mean, okay. So the dream goal, which is never going to happen is completely, you know, we're all immune and the virus just goes away. Right. Um, but, but that's not how biology works. So um, you're right. The barn stable scenario. I mean, if everybody's vaccinated um, and, and if this becomes a cold, which is an annoyance, but you're not going to the hospital. You're not, there's no mortality associated with it. That I think is a good scenario to aim for. The problem is we're, we're still in this race because um, you know, we really got to get the virus less opportunities um, to, to hop from person to person to person. Because right now um, it's, it's having a field day. But um, yeah, I... I I think the end goal is to have it just be this low level thing that we encounter as, you know, part of our regular annual cycle. Um, but we're nowhere near, near that yet. So, and when we're gonna get there, it really depends upon, you know, how many people get vaccinated, how fast we get vaccinated, the efficacy of booster shots, masking, you know, all of those things that you're hearing about um, they will impact how fast we get to some sort of, I don't want to say, maybe endpoint is not the word, right? Because I don't think it's going to go away, but some sort of low level. Right. It, follow up to that, just I know other people have questions, that getting the vaccine rates up, what, what is your take on children under 12 and, and how that's going to impact things? Um, I know they're not as severe, I, I'm not as concerned. I have young kids, but they're unvaccinated, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope sooner rather than later, um, because I, what I, this is a worst case scenario. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't like that we're seeing the number of pediatric cases rising um, in the southern part of our country, um, and and and. Lie. Okay, um, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed that. But, um, you know, I, I just, I really, I, I want to see as the virus slow down as much as possible. And I want to have that opportunity for children to, to get that vaccine. Um, I did, did I hear late at the end of this year, early next year for Pfizer, BioNTech for children under 12? Um, I don't remember the last last thing I read on that, but it, it's coming. Right. Right. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so yeah, I was muted again. Sorry about that, Marcy. I, I put that person back into the waiting room. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> so next we have Kathy Deutsch. 
Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Yes. Hi, Kathy. Thank you, Doctor, for your time. And thank you, Tony, for arranging this. It's a, a wonderful opportunity for our community. I have three questions. I'll make them brief, but I think that they're useful, broadly useful. One is that now that the Delta variant is prevalent and it is much more infectious, has the type of mask that is recommended for daily use changed? And how do we kind of view masking differently or not? Um, that's one question. And if you want to answer that, then I can move to my other quick question. Yeah. I was like, if you're going to ask me all three, I don't know if I can remember. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I'll tell you, um, so on my university's COVID-19 task force, when we were trying to make decisions um, for what the fall would look like, we had a ton of conversations about masking. And um, our legal counsel kept asking the exact same question you're asking, Kathy. And um, it's funny that I kept having to say to them, I have not heard anything. I have not read any papers or heard anything about changes in what types of masks. Um, you know, and he, he kept saying, well, I keep hearing the N95 mask is the mask to get. And certainly the N95 mask, that's, that's what I used when I work with TB in, in a biosafety level three. That's what um, medical professionals are using, um, you know, so uh, that is kind of the mask du jour. Right. However, there's a catch with the N95 and that is you can buy an N95, you could wear an N95, but all of us who um, work in situations where, you know, daily we're exposed to respiratory pathogens, we get something called fit testing, mm -hmm. right? And so- right. Um, if, if you buy an N95 and you don't get fit tested, then, um, you know, you're not guaranteed pr protection. There is a process you have to go through in order to, to uh, make sure the N95 works correctly. Um, so I haven't heard anything about differences in masking. Um, before I was vaccinated, and I, I take Metro North, I go down into the city, I have, I have been the entire pandemic. Um, on the days that my labs are being run. Um, and so I was double masking for a while there. I had, um, you know, the, the disposable mask underneath mm -hmm. and I looped the, um, the, the ear ties to make it tighter. And then I had a, a double layer cloth mask on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and that worked for me. Okay. So layered cloth masks um, are potentially still protective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, that's what I've been using. Good to know. Okay. <laughs> Second question. Thank you for that. Um, um, as we're kind of maybe entering our period of waning immunity for those of us who were immunized early as I and my husband were, you know, of course we're wanting to get the boosters without hesitation, but the boosters um, will protect us from the variants that are currently circulating because it's the same vaccine that we previously got. So um, obviously I imagine research is being done for boosters which will address new, more complicated variants. And so uh, my concern is that getting the new boosters I think is necessary, but will we be getting, uh, it's hard to answer, I know, like the protection that we need from new variants that are already starting to circulate. And that is a wonderful question. Um, Maybe I should have gone to science. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, I don't know much about, I mean, I, I did read somewhere in the news and I forgot, I already forgot where I read it, but you know, that Biden was saying that we were going to use the, the vaccines that we currently have as boosters. Right. Um, I also have read that both Moderna, Moderna and um, Pfizer were working on creating you know, variant specific boosters, um, it's, it's easy to do that with, with mRNA. I mean, you just, you saw in the evolution video, like right. changing one um, nucleotide results in a change. And, and that, I mean, it's simple to re-engineer the mRNA vaccines to have these hot mutations that Delta has. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think, I, I think the issue would be 
making enough of that re-engineered um, vaccine product into actual vac vaccines. Um, so I, I, I think right now, you're right, the sense is that we're gonna use what we've got, but um, hopefully, you know, we'll get something a little bit more specific. Right, it's, <laughs> it's evolving constantly. Yes. And hopefully probably useful to many people as well. I do have children that, you know, finally like left, you know, like the isolation unit here and are living um, normal lives in, in you know, their peer groups and like, want to come home. And the last time my child came home, we had her do a PCR test and which was negative, which was very positive. And I said, come home. So um, is it like the gold standard for that? Should every time my child wants to come from New York City, who is still being smart and masking and limiting activities, but certainly a young person who wants to live a young person's life has different exposures than older folks that maybe are more willing to give up certain things. So should we be doing PCR tests as we try to gather together more regularly? I think that as that- As to a quick test. Yeah, so PCR is much more accurate than the quick test because it's a more sensitive technique. Mm -hmm. um, I think that depends upon your comfort level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I go into the city and I uh, saw my parents last week, you know, and, and I'm, but I temper that with, this is my profession. So, right. you know, this is, we are now living in, or you're all living in something that I've been living in for over 20 years. Um, but I, I, I'm comfortable going to see my parents because I know my behaviors and my parents certainly know my behaviors. I, so I, right. I really think it, it's, it has to be a judgment call based upon your own level Exposures. of color. Yeah. Right. Okay. So PCR it is. Yeah. I mean, what I can tell you here, how about this? For PACE, what we're doing in the fall is um, we're, we're mandating vaccination for all members of our community. Um, those individuals, except if you have a religious or a medical exemption. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, the individuals who have the exemptions, um, we are requiring that they get tested. We're mm -hmm. calling it gateway testing before they come to campus. Um, and then when they arrive, we're gonna test them weekly. Right. Right, because we wanna make sure they're protected. And we also wanna make sure that the rest of the community is protected from them. Right. So um, yeah, so that would be an example, right? They're unvaccinated. Um, you know, and this is particularly for the, for the younger college students, right. because sometimes they have behaviors that, um, don't really focus necessarily on, you know, preventing the spread of the disease. <laughs> right. So, you know, I yeah. have one in my house as well, who I have to continue to bug to put the mask on. So I, <laughs> I, I yeah. know this firsthand. Thank you. I really appreciate you giving me the time to ask these questions. Appreciate it. No worries. It. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Thank you. Before we go to Peter Parsons has his hand up, but there's another question in the chat mm -hmm. from Anna Walrus. How to interpret a result of antigen test of 200? We recovered from the illness in April 2021, and I can't find any info about this sort of natural immunity after a full recovery. Uh, so I, I, to be honest with you, um, I don't know how to interpret an antigen test result of 200. I'm not sure what that means. Um, that's more of, so like, it's really hard the distinction between what I am versus what a physician is. And that's more of a physician type question. Like if you have questions about like the actual organism that causes disease or the details of how the immune response interacts with it, that information I have at the tip of my fingers, but I'd have to look this up as well. Um, natural immunity after a full recovery. Yeah. The only thing is that one paper I, I reported in the presentation, um, that said that natural immunity. So if you were infected and now you're, um, naturally immune starts to wane around eight months. Um, but I don't have, I can't give you a metric that like the antibody antigens at 200, I can't tell you what metric to use for that. Sorry. Okay, so Peter, you're next. Um, 
is one of every year I go and get a flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's normally I gather a different vaccine each year. Oh, they tell me it is. Yeah, it is. Is there any interaction between the flu and COVID? Or are they completely separate and we should treat them separately? So let me follow up your question with a question, just to clarify. <laughs> Are, when you say, is there any interaction, do you mean, is there any interaction between the two vaccinations? Mm -hmm. Or do you mean, is there any interaction between the two um, viruses? Both. Ah, <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> okay, so any interaction between the vaccinations. So um, I do not recall any reports in the V-A-E-R-S, that's the vaccine reporting system of any in negative interactions between the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and the flu vaccine. Um, I'm an N of one, but I can, well, no, I have an N of four in my house. I can tell you that all four of us got both and we did not experience any vaccination issues from both. Um, I know that- Good enough answer on that one. Now, how about the uh, disease itself? Yeah, so, um, What's interesting is they're both respiratory pathogens. They're bo they both um, start their infections by getting into respiratory epithelial cells. So those are the cells on the like, surface of your respiratory tract. So um, that can be problematic because they're both attacking the same type of cell. Um, you know, in thinking about the bio, the virology of um, the flu virus, one of the things that it can do is digest mucus. So mm -hmm. it digests the mucus in your respiratory tract that exposes, so that your respiratory tract has mucus to protect it and then it's got the cells, right? So the flu virus can digest the mucus to make it easier for it to get to the cells. So I would imagine that that would help SARS right? Because SARS-CoV-2 does not have the ability to digest mucus. So I would imagine them together, not a good thing. <laughs> All right. Sounds useful. Tony, all yours. Okay. Um, oh, and any other Mary questions? Not out there. Yeah, Jim. I get it could be a problem. I don't see any other hands up. It's so sad. Okay. Um, any other questions? Oh, wait, there's another yeah, there's, in the, the chat. chat. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, yes, George, both. Wait, this is a direct message. Do you see this too? No, I just see the one, there's one from Anna. Okay, Wallace. so George, George asked me, um, initially we were told masks protect other people, but I think you're saying it protects the users and those nearby. Yeah, so um, yes. So originally scientists thought that masks only protected the users, right? That's why we wear them in the lab and why um, you know, medical professionals were wearing them in the hospital setting even before COVID-19. Now what we're showing is that not only does it protect the user, but it protects the people around the user as well because it's a barrier for respiratory aerosols to get out. And then Anna, wait, who can, I don't know. I don't know what the, you said. There was another, another question in the chat. Yeah, there. she, a Anna Waller is uh, eight months of natural immunity. Oh, it was just a statement. Eight months yeah. of natural immunity after a full recovery sounds great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. agreed. <laughs> Sorry if we answered this already. If someone has lower T cells, are they affected by, by COVID-19 more? Yeah, so um, Kat, thanks. This is oh, this was a direct message to me too. So, um, so the price. So we, <laughs> without giving a, a very long immunology lecture, um, your immune system has two parts, right? One part produces antibodies. The other part produces T cells. Um, and generally, um, even though we talk about antibodies a lot in the, the context of SARS-CoV-2. Um, 
the antibody response is less in not, I'm going to say less important. It is imp still important, but it's less important than the T cell immune response. The T cell immune response um, primarily is what's responsible for clearing viral infections. So um, yes, if somebody has lower T cells, then yes, the, the complications from COVID-19 can be more severe. Um, okay. All right, I think I don't see anything else. George um, uh, okay, so there's George has his hand up, so I'll give him another opportunity. Go ahead, George. Okay, just real quick, thank you for your answer. Uh, what annoys me about the mask situation early on, I mean, and it really annoys me, is that <laughs> I work in construction mm -hmm. and I always wear an N95 mask. Uh -huh. So it almost seemed ridiculous to suggest that the only purpose to wear it was to protect another individual as much as that is true. And I, I don't understand how science could logically look at the general <clears throat> workforce, including yourself, how they try to protect themselves and say, but wait a minute, you're only doing it for someone else. And how could they do that? How can no. they be one-sided in that approach? No, no, okay, so, so we as a scientific community have always believed that masks protect the wearer, right? Um, and we never asked the question about if someone wears a mask, will that also protect others around, right? And so that never, that never crossed our minds to, to address that because we've never found ourselves in this scenario with the tools we have right now to actually answer that question. And so now we know that masking, in addition to protecting the wearer, also protects others around us. Now, there's two reasons why that's important. One is that by protecting the others around us, we're actually also protecting ourselves because if we protect the others around us, then they don't become a host to the virus and the virus doesn't mutate. And then the virus, if it mutates, doesn't come back to us. So that's one reason. And the second reason why it's good to protect those around us is that there are some individuals who unfortunately, for whatever reason, can't get vaccinated. And that may be because um, the individual asked the question about the fact that they have, um, that. Um, they had a low T cell response. Um, maybe that would preclude them from getting a vaccination, right? So there are individuals, or I can give you an example from me. I have received the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine five times. Um, and I never developed immunity to rubella. And so I am by no fault of my own, completely susceptible to the rubella virus which causes severe congenital um, issues um, in children and um, in utero. And when I was pregnant with my younger son, of course there was a rubella outbreak by where I lived. So um, in that case, if this was COVID-19 and I never developed immunity to COVID-19, I would need to rely on others around me to wear a mask to protect me. I would also wear a mask as well. So those are two scenarios where masking helps the user and others around. I, I thought the way the, the scientific community early on was expressing the use of a mask was specifically only to protect other people, not yourself. That's the way it came across to me. Yeah, I, I'm sorry it did come across that way. It shouldn't have, um, and that might be, scientists are terrible at communicating what we know. <laughs> I can 100% okay. I can right. say that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, okay, that's great. I just <laughs> wanted to be sure I wasn't crazy. <laughs> nope, you're not crazy. Okay, we're, you. we're bad at that. <laughs> thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, the, Anna Walleris, um, 
Uh, she, yeah, she had an earlier question she wants us to go back to here. How, how different is the natural immunity after recovery compared to vaccine? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question too. I don't think we know enough yet to answer that question, right? And one of the reasons, excuse me, one of the reasons why I can't answer that question is because of um, what the virus does to the human immune response and how it affects immunity, which we don't fully understand yet. Um, so we know more about how the vaccine controls the immune response because that's, that's a more controlled scenario. We know what the vaccine is doing. We know how it, the immune response responds to it. But COVID-19 has been this big enigma with respect to how it's interacting with the immune response. Um, so I can't answer that question really either. Okay, so let me see. Okay, I think that's, that's it. Anybody else uh, wanna ask a question? Going once, twice. All right. Okay. Well, I think we're we're good. So thank you very much, Marcy, for for this. Thank you. I hope that this was helpful. And um, you know, if you have any other questions, I don't mind sharing my email. So it's mkelly2. Here, I'll put it in the chat at pace.edu. Um, if you just do M Kelly, somebody else is going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. So yeah, there's my too. email. Okay. Um, so if anybody has any additional questions, you can feel free to ask. Okay. And, uh, right. and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll place your presentation. I'll put it on the website, the town website, Perfect. and make it available to folks. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay. All right. All right. Good night, everyone. Oh, Thank good you. Night. Thanks again, Marcy. Bye-bye. Yep. You're welcome.